Hello, this is Maysam Safari and I am setting for Canadian Security Certificate. I am going to read the Canadian Securities course book provided to us by Canadian Securities Institute. I am going to record every chapter I read and I will share it publicly for uh, my personal revisit and for anyone else who is interested in setting for Canadian Securities Certificate. So, Chapter 1. Chapter 1. The Canadian Securities Industry. Chapter Overview. In this chapter, we describe the interrelationships between the various participants in the Canadian Securities Industry. In particular, we discuss the important role that investment dealers and other financial intermediaries play in channeling funds between lenders and borrowers. Learning Objectives 1. Describe the relationships between the major participants in Canadian securities industry. Overview of Canadian securities industry. 2. Distinguish among the three categories of investment dealers including how they are organized. Content areas is the investment dealer's role as financial intermediary. As well as three, explain the differences between principal and agency transaction. Learning objective four is distinguish among the roles of various financial institutions. This is found in content areas, financial intermediaries, other than investment dealers. And finally, learning objective five is discuss the trends affecting the financial services industry in Canada and globally, where it's in the content areas of financial market trends. Key terms are defined in glossary and appear in bold text in the chapter. Agent, broker. Capital Markets, CDS, Clearing and Depository Services, Inc., Clearing, Closed End Fund, Consumer Finance Company, Discount Broker, Financial Intermediary, Fintech, Firewall, Institutional Firm, Integrated Firm, Investment Dealer, Investment Fund, Investment Industry Association of Canada, Mutual Fund, Open End Fund, Pension Fund, Primary Market Distribution, Principal, Retail Firm, Robo Advisor, Sales Finance Company, Saving Bank, Schedule 1 Bank, Schedule 2 Bank, Schedule 3 Bank, Self-Directed Broker, Settlement. Introduction. Consider the following scenarios. A couple needs to borrow money to buy a home. An entrepreneur need to raise funds to develop a new product. A mother wants to set up a regular program to save for her children's education. Both the couple and the entrepreneur as borrowers are users of capital, whereas the mother as an investor is the supplier of capital. What they all have in common is the need for a financial intermediary to help them meet their goals. A financial intermediary is an institution such as a bank that borrows money, money from suppliers of capital and lends it to users of capital. In other words, investors lend funds to the intermediary and the intermediary in return lends those funds to borrowers in the form of loans, mortgages, and other products, an intermediary can also play a more direct role. The intermediary can raise capital by bringing a new issue of securities to the financial markets. For example, a company wishing to expand its business might generate the necessary investment capital by issuing securities to the public in the form of stocks. An investment dealer helps the company issues these stocks and sells them to investors. The investors who buy these stocks transfer their money to the company through the intermediary. In return, they receive the stocks, which represent a share of ownership 
of the company. The company can use the proceeds from the stock transaction and, and reinvest them in the firm, which spurs further economic development. In addition, the intermediary earns profit on the transaction. If the firm does well following the expansion and the price of its stock rises in value, investors will be able to sell them in the marketplace to earn a profit. By these means, financial intermediaries help to establish efficient methods of channeling funds between lenders and borrower. Dive deeper. To fully understand the concepts presented in this textbook, you should stay informed about the financial markets and the industry in general. The lessons will be easier to grasp if you relate them to the activities that unfold each day in the financial markets. Countless sources of information about the financial markets are readily available online, as well as in the newspapers, books, and magazines. Ultimately, by staying informed, you will be you will more easily reach your goals of becoming a competent and trusted participant in the security industry. Overview of the Canadian securities industry. Learning objective. One, describe the relationship between the major participant in the Canadian securities industry. Canada has one of the most sophisticated and efficient capital markets in the world. Market activity is measured by the variety and size of new issues that are brought to the market, as well as the depth and liquidity of trading of those issues. Canada's security industry is highly competitive and it is becoming more competitive each year. Market participants must have extensive, specialized, and up-to-date knowledge about the securities issues and investor in a securities market that is constantly changing. An entrepreneurial spirit of innovation and calculated risk-taking are among its hallmarks. Change and volatility are frequently the norm. The Canadian securities industry is mainly regulated by the provinces. They have the power to create and enforce their own laws and regulations through securities commissions, called securities administrators in some provinces. Securities commissions delegate some of their powers to self-regulatory organizations, or SRO, such as the Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada, or IRROC. The SROs establish and enforce industry regulations that protect investors and maintain fair, equitable, and ethical practices. In that capacity, SROs are responsible for setting the rules that govern many aspects of investment dealers' operations, including sales, finances, and tradings. The major participant in the industry and their interrelationships are illustrated in Figure 1.1. Figure 1.1 structure of the Canadian securities industry. This figure on top has investment dealers in between of suppliers of capital or investors on left side and users of capital or borrowers on the right side. There is money flow between suppliers of capitals with investment dealers and subsequently with users of capital. Investment dealers also have money flow to the markets, a bidirectional money flow. Additionally, investment dealers have bidirectional inform information flow with clearing, clearing and settlements, as well as self-regulatory organizations, like Investment Industry Regulatory Organization of Canada, 
or mutual funds dealer associations. SROs have inflow of information from Canadian Securities Institute, which is industry educator, Canadian Investor Protection Fund, which is industry insurance fund, and provincial regulators like security commissions. The various participants interact with each other as follow. Suppliers and users of capital trade financial Capital trade financial instruments through financial markets such as stock exchanges and money markets. Investment dealers, also called brokers, act as intermediaries by matching investors with the users of capital. Each side of a transaction has its own dealer who matches the trade trades through the tr market. Trades and other transactions are cleared and settled through organizations such as CDS Clearing and Depository Services Inc. and banks. Clearing is the process of confirming and matching security trade details. Settlements is the irrevocable moment when cash and securities are exchanged. The SROs set and enforce rules that govern market activity and monitor the market to ensure fairness and transparency. The Canadian Investor Protection Fund and similar organizations provide insurance against dealers' insolvency. Provincial regulators oversee the market and the SROs. The Canadian Security Institute and similar organizations provide education for industry participants. Did you know industry statistics? According to recent statistics from the Investment Industry Association of Canada, or IIAC, there are 164 IIROC firms in the securities industry. Together, these firms employ more than 44,000 people. For more information, please visit the industry detail available on the IIAC website at www.iiac.ca. The Canadian Securities Industry Overview How well do you know the structure of the Canadian security industry? and the interrelationships between its major participants. Complete the online learning activity to assess your knowledge. Note, to access the online components of your course, log into your student profile at www.csi.ca and once logged in, click on the Access Online Courses button. The investment dealer's role as a financial intermediary. Learning Objective 2. Distinguish among the three categories of investment dealers including how they are organized. And 3. Explain the difference between principal and agency transactions. The term financial intermediary describes any organization that facilitates the trading or movement of financial instruments that transfers capital between suppliers and users of capital. Intermediaries are a key component of the financial system. They include investment dealers, banks, credit unions, trust companies and insurance companies. Let's look at the role of the investment dealers as a financial intermediary. Investment dealers act on their client's behalf as agents in the transfer of financial instrument between different investors. They sometimes also act principals rather than agents. In both cases, they play a significant role in the securities industry's two main functions. One, they help to transfer capital from suppliers to users through the underwriting and distribution of new securities. This activity takes place in the primary market in the form of a primary market distribution 
or primary offering. When a private company goes public and issues stocks in the primary market for the very first time, the sale is known as an initial public offering or IPO. Number two, the main secondary market in which previously issued or outstanding securities can be traded. For example, buying and selling a stock through the Toronto Stock Exchange. Types of investment dealers. The following three categories of investment dealers make up the Canadian securities industry. Retail firms include full-service investment dealers and self-directed brokers, also known as discount brokers. Full-service retail firms offer a wide variety of products and services for the retail investors. They also provide various levels of advice depending on the financial and wealth managing concerns of the investor's client. Self-directed brokers on the other hand, I consider the do-it-yourself approach to investing. They execute trades for clients at reduced rates. They do not provide investment advice. 2. Institutional firms are investment dealers that serve exclusively institutional clients, organizations that trade large volume of securities. Institutional clients include pension funds and mutual funds and may be domestic or foreign institutional firms. In Canada, foreign firms account for about one-third of all institutional clients. Foreign firms include affiliates of many of the major U.S. and European securities dealers. Third, integrated firms. Other offer products and services across the industry and participate fully in both the retail and institutional markets. Most integrated firms underwrite all type of federal, provincial, and municipal debt, as well as corporate debt and equity issues. They are active in secondary markets, including the money markets, as well as on all Canadian stock exchanges and some foreign exchanges. Many smaller retail and institutional investment dealers, known as investment boutiques, specialize in particular market segments. For example, an investment boutique might specialize in stock trading, bond trading, or trading strictly in unlisted stocks. Organization within firms. The operational structure of investment dealers varies widely in the industry. A typical configuration divides the firm into different departments, with each department focusing on a specific task. A larger integrated firm, for example, might be organized into front, middle, and back offices, with senior management overseeing all departments. The roles of the various departments are described below. Senior management. Senior management industry. Senior management usually includes a chairperson, a president, an executive vice president, directors, and departmental vice presidents, some of whom are also directors. Some firms may have directors from outside the security industry. Most senior officers work at the head office, but some may be in charge of reg regional branch offices in Canada or abroad. Front, middle, and back offices. The three-level organizational structure of most investment dealers allow them to manage client portfolios effectively and process trades efficiently in compliance with regulatory requirements. The function and duties of each department are described in Table 1.1. Table 1.1 Departmental function at an investment dealer. Role Front office role is perform, performs all staff functions pertaining directly to portfolio management activities, 
functions portfolio management, trading, sales, and marketing. Middle office. Role is perf performs functions critical to the efficient operation of the firm. Its functions are compliance, accounting, audits, and legal. And back office role is to settle the firm's security transactions. Its functions are trade settlements. The success of an investment dealer tests rests largely on profits generated by its sales department, which is usually the largest unit in the firm's front office. In an integrated firm, the sales department is typically separated into institutional and retail sales. The retail sales force serves individual investors and smaller business accounts. It usually comprises the largest single group of a firm's employees. Retail investment advisors normally perform a wide range of activities to meet the complete spectrum of the investor's types and needs. The principal and agency functions of an investment dealer. Investment dealers facilitate the trading of securities and the transfer of capital between suppliers and users. These sometimes act as principals, at other times they act as agents for their clients. Principal transactions. When they act as principals, investment dealers may own the securities as part of their inventory at some stages of the buying and selling transactions within, with investors. The difference between the buying price and the selling price of the securities is their gross profit or loss. Another principal transaction is underwriting. In the securities business, underwriting refers to purchasing from a government body or from a company a new issue of securities or a give, on a given date at a specified price. When investment dealers act as principals by underwriting, they use their own capital to buy an issue to then sell it at a profit in the primary market. After a primary distribution is completed, investment dealers also act as principals in secondary markets by maintaining an inventory of already issued outstanding securities. In these transactions, the dealers buy securities in the open market, hold them in inventory for, a, for varying periods of time, and subsequently sell them. Agency transactions. When investment dealers act as agent on behalf of buyers or sellers, they do not own a title to the securities that they deal with at any time during the transaction. Their profit is the agent's commission they charge for each transaction. In these transactions, the principals are the clients who buy and sell securities and who own the securities. The agent acting for the seller and the agent acting for the buyer both respectively charge their clients a commission for executing the trade. The principal and agent roles in security transactions are illustrated in figure 1.2. Figure 1.2 Principal versus agent transaction. Seller interact with principal who interacts with buyer. However, seller interact with buyer with support of agent. Did you know an agent acting on behalf of a client is often called a broker, and the broker role is generally thought of as that of an agent. However, the term broker is commonly used to describe an investment dealer acting in 
any capacity. Generally, for most secondary trading of debt securities, the investment dealer acts as principal, although occasionally some agency trades take place. With new money market issues, for example, a dealer may either sell the securities as an agent or take them into inventory as principal for a later resale. Services provided by investment dealers by participating in the secondary market and maintaining an inventory of outstanding securities, investment dealers provide several useful services. They provide informed advice about the terms and features for new issues in the primary market based on their knowledge of current conditions in the secondary market. They add liquidity to the market with relative ease by making transactions from their inventory rather than waiting for stim simultaneous matching buy-sell orders from other investors. They sometimes act as market makers and carry out market making duties by taking positions in assigned listed stocks to enhance market liquidity and smooth out undue price distortions. They sometimes buy listed stocks as principals, thus accumulating large blocks of shares, becoming more competitive in serving their larger institutional clients. The liquidity they add to the secondary market enhances the primary market by assuring that buyers of new securities will be able to sell their holding at reasonable prices. Investment dealers also trade from their own account to make a profit. Ooh. Interesting. The clearing system. During a trading day, exchange members act as both buyers and sellers of many listed stocks, rather than each member making a separate settlement with another member on each trade during the course of a trading day. A designated central clearing system handles the daily settlement process between members. In Canada, securities are cleared through CDS, Clearing and Depository Services. Although CDS is not considered a financial intermediary, it is a valued partner to dealers that operate in the securities market. Providing reliable clearing services, CDS operates CDSX, the facility for the clearing and settlement of trades in equity and debt securities in Canada and for various cross-border transactions. Marketplaces such as the, the Toronto Stock Exchange, TSX, the TSX Venture Exchange, an alternative trading system reports traced to CDSX. Over-the-counter trades are also reported, reported to CDS by participants in the system. Participants with access to the clearing and settlement system primarily include banks, investment dealers, and trust companies. The central clearing system uses a process called netting to establish and confirm a credit or debit position balance in the form of cash or security. For each dealer member, the netting process compiles each firm's clearing settlement sheets and informs each member of the securities or funds it must deliver to balance its account. In this way, the number of securities and the amount of cash that must change hands among the various members each day is substantially reduced. The key roles of an investment dealer. Question. What is the difference between an investment dealer's role as a principal and its role as an agent. It's a question for you.
Financial intermediaries other than investment dealers. Learning objective four. Distinguish among the roles of the various financial institutions. So far, you have learned about the role that investment dealers play as financial intermediaries. We now discuss other financial intermediaries, including charter banks, credit union, and cases populaires, trust companies, insurance companies, and other types of firms that play an intermediary role in the Canadian financial services industry. Chartered banks. In Canada, the primary function of the chartered banks is to accept and safeguard deposits from individuals and businesses, many, mainly in the form of deposits and to then lend or transfer those funds to users in the form of mortgages, car loans, business loans and other lending instruments. All chartered banks in Canada operate under the Bank Act and must function within its regulatory framework. The Bank Act is the federal re legislation that sets out operating rules and restrictions for banks and is updated regularly, usually through five-year revision cycles. Under the Bank Act, banks are designated as a Schedule 1, Schedule 2, or Schedule 3. Each designation has unique rules and regulations surrounding the bank's activities. Most Canadian-owned banks are designated as Schedule 1 banks, whereas foreign-owned banks are either Schedule 2 or Schedule 3 banks. Schedule 1 Chartered Banks Schedule 1 banks are banks that are not a subsidiary of a foreign bank and are considered domestic banks even if they have foreign shareholders. They are currently more than 30 domestic Schedule 1 banks in operations in Canada. Six Canadian banks stand out in terms of asset size above all other Canadian-owned banks, as well as most other non-bank financial institutions. Did you know Canada's big six banks are Bank of Montreal, or BMO, Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, or CIBC, National Bank of Canada, Royal Bank of Canada, or RBC, Scotia Bank, Toronto Dominion Bank or TD Bank Group. The six major banks have achieved their dominant asset sizes by establishing a network of thousands of retail branches and automated teller machines throughout Canada. These outlets attract and centralize most of the savings of Canadians. Schedule 1 banks have also expanded their international operations by acquiring or investing in foreign international financial institutions. Currently, voting shares of large Schedule 1 bank must be widely held with the control of any single shareholder or group of shareholders restricted to no more than 20%. In contrast, a single shareholder, individual company, can own up to 65% of the voting shares of a medium-sized bank, which has shareholders' equity of $2 billion or more, but less than $12 billion. However, the remaining 35% of voting shares must be publicly traded. A small bank which has shareholder equity of less than $2 billion, can be fully owned by 1% or organization. Hmm. Canadian banks offer a wide variety of consumer commercial banking products and services, including mortgages, loans, accounts, and investments.
Saving deposit are eligible for deposit insurance, which is provided by the Canadian Deposit Insurance Corporation or CDIC. Bank, banks also offer financial planning, cash management, and wealth management services, some directly and some through subsidiaries. Within the banking group, subsidiaries also handle services such as investment dealer activities, self-directed investing, and the sales of insurance products. Current legislations allow banks to take part in diverse sectors of the financial service industry. However, the Bank Act sets control on these activities, particularly with regard to the sharing of customer information. The barriers that inhibit information shares across a bank's various business units are commonly known as firewalls. Example, a bank offers checking accounts and mortgage mortgages through its local branches as customers visit the branch to ask about opening a self-directed investment account. The customer is then directed to the bank's investment dealer subsidiary and receives all further related correspondence from this, that subsidiary. However, the bank branch has no access to any information about the customer's brokerage account or trades. Likewise, the investment dealer subsidiary has no access to the customer's bank account or loan balances. In this way, the operations of different business within the same banking group are kept separate. One major source of income for banks is the activity of lending funds to individuals or companies at an interest rate that is higher than the interest rate that the banks pay out on deposits and other borrowings. The spread between the two sets of interest rates cover the bank's operating costs, including rents, salaries, administration, and appropriation for loan losses. Spread also provides a margin of profit for the bank. Schedule, do, schedule 2 and Schedule 3 banks Schedule 2 banks are incorporated and operate in Canada's federally regulated foreign banks subsidiaries. The deposit that these banks accept may be eligible for deposit insurance provided by the CDIC. The banks may also engage in all type of business permitted to a Schedule 1 bank. Schedule 2 banks derive most of their revenue from retail banking and electronic financial services. Examples of Schedule 2 banks in Canada include the Amex Bank of Canada, Citibank Canada, and UBS Bank Canada. Schedule 3 banks are federally regulated foreign banks branches of foreign institutions that have been authorized under the Bank Act to do banking business in Canada. Schedule 3 banks tend to focus on corporate and institutional finance and investment banking. Examples of Schedule 3 banks in Canada include Barclay Banks, Commercial Banks, and the Bank of New York Mellon. The government allows foreign banks to operate in Canada, which in turn helps Canadian-owned Schedule 1 banks conduct operations abroad. Foreign-owned banks in Canada also provide a conduit for investment of foreign capital in Canada, while also providing an alternative source of borrowed funds for Canadian corporate borrowers. Credit unions and Cisis Populaire. Credit unions and Crisis Populaires offer businesses and consumers a wide variety of banking services. They provide deposit taking services, lending, mortgages, mutual funds, insurances, investment dealers, services, and debit and credit cards. Credit unions often 
cater to member savers from common interest groups such as individuals who live in the same neighborhood share similar ethnic background or belong to the same business or social group the federal legislations governing credit unions is the cooperative credit associations act or ccaa this act generally limits the activities of credit unions they can provide financial services to their members entities in which they have a substantial investment and certain type of cooperative institutions. They can also provide administrative, educational, and other services to cooperative credit societies. The CCAA requires associations to adhere to investment rules based on a prudent portfolio approach. It prohibits associations from acquiring substantial investment in entities other than a list of authorized financial and quasi-financial entities. It also sets out a number of limits des designed to restrict the exposure of associations to real property and equity securities. Trust and loan companies. Federally and provincially incorporated trust companies are the only corporations in Canada authorized to engage in a trust business. Trust companies act as a trustee in the charge of corporate and individual assets such as property, stocks and bonds. They also offer a broad range of financial services that overlap services provided by the chartered banks. For example, trust companies accept savings, issue term deposit, make personal and mortgage loans, and sell registered retirement saving plans and other tax deferred plans. In addition, they provide estate planning and asset management. Insurance companies. The insurance industry has two main lines of business. The first line of business is life insurance, while the second line of business is known as property, property and casualty insurance. Life insurance includes the following related products, health and disability insurance, term and whole life insurance, pension plans, registered retirement saving plans, annuities. Because life insurance companies act as trustee for the fund entrusted to them by the policyholders, they must exercise extreme caution in selecting the investments so that they can be sure to meet future contractual obligations. Property and casualty insurance encompasses protection against loss of the following items. Home, auto commercial business according to insurance bureau of canada the largest aggregate premiums in the property and casualty line of business are generated by automobile insurance followed by property insurance and liability insurance underwriting is the most important aspect of the insurance business in canada Insurance underwriting is the business of evaluating the risk in associating contractual responsibility that the insurance company is willing to accept in exchange for its client's insurance premium. The other significant aspect of the insurance business is reinsurance. Reinsurance refers to the practice of exchanging risk between insurance companies to facilitate better risk management. Did you know the key federal legislations governing insurance companies is the Insurance Companies Act? This legislation grants companies an enhanced power to make consumer and corporate loans, but it also contains restriction on activities such as in-house trust services and deposit taking. Furthermore, it allows only life insurance companies to offer annuities and segregated funds. Some Canadian Schedule 1 banks fully own insurance companies. However, 
although these large domestic banks have established their own insurance subsidiaries, the Bank Act forbids them from selling insurance through the branch networks, with the exception of insurance related to loans and mortgages. Other financial intermediaries. Several other financial intermediaries play an important, important role in the Canadian financial service industry. These businesses are categorized below according to the types of products and services they offer. Investment funds are companies or trusts that sell shares or units to the public and invest the proceeds in a diverse securities portfolio. Closed-end funds typically issue shares only at the start at a startup or at other infrequent periods, whereas open-end funds, commonly called mutual funds, continually issue shares to investors and redeem these shares on demand. Of the two type of funds, open-end funds are by far the larger, accounting for approximately 95% of aggregate funds invested. ATB Financial, originally established as the Alberta Treasury Branches, known as Saving Banks, were formed in 1938, when charter banks pulled out their branches from many smaller towns. The ATB became a provincial crown corporation in 1997 and was renamed ATB Financial in 2002. These banks provide a full range of financial services to Albertans. Consumer finance companies make direct cash loans to consumers who are usually unable to secure a loan from a bank. Consumer finance companies typically charge higher rates of interest than banks. Self-finance companies purchase installment sales contracts from retailers and dealers at a discount when items such as new cars, appliances or home improvement are bought on installment plans by consumer. Interesting. Sale finance companies. And finally, pension plans have accounted for remarkable growth in the institutionalization of saving during the past 60 years. Other type, other financial intermediaries, apart from investment dealers, who are the intermediaries and what role do they play in the capital markets? Oh, so it's a question. Apart from investment dealers, who are the intermediaries and what role do they play in the capital markets? Financial Market Trends Learning Objective 5 Discuss the trends affecting the financial services industry in Canada and globally. Various recent trends have made an impact in Canada and around the world. Some of the more important trends are described below. Financial Technology Financial technology companies, known collectively as the fintech industry, take advantage of computer technology to support or enable a variety of banking and financial products and services, including online loans, electronic wallets, and automated financial planning software. The fintech industry is challenging the role of traditional financial services institutions in Canada and around the world. Robo-advisors in recent years, a new online investment service has emerged that provides client with advice in contrast to the execution-only model of self-directed brokerage, popularly known as robo-advisors. These firms began to 
disappear in the United States after the 2008 financial crisis, but did not gain traction until 2012. By 2019, they had amassed more than 700 billion in asset under management in Canada. Online investment advice platform began to proliferate in 2014 with multiple service providers registered in several provinces by mid-2016. Robo-advisors in Canada currently hold more than $8 billion in asset under management. Many variations on robo-advisor services exist in the United States and Canada, but most share several of the following attributes. They provide clients with goal-based online investment management. Portfolios are created using algorithms based on modern portfolio theory and on online client questionnaires. A telephone call with an advisor verifies that the computer-generated portfolio is suitable for the client. Advisor support is offered to varying degrees, typically online or by phone. Portfolios are built primarily with exchange-traded fund. The portfolio, portfolios are regularly rebalanced. Financial planning may be offered in varying degrees. Services may be provided to the end clients as well as to intermediaries such as advisors and employers. Competitive positioning is based on the client experience, which typically encompasses the following services. Ease of online navigation, speed of account opening and transfers, integrations, integration of service delivery across devices, transparency of performance and fees. Portfolio management is optimized with tools such as tax-efficient rebalancing across account types. Social and economics shifts. Lifestyle and social trends continuously affect the financial industry, especially trends related to the following key factors. Demographics, defined benefits and defined contribution pension plans, saving rates, debt levels. Demographics. Demographic shifts are reshaping Canada's economy and will continue to do so. Baby boomers comprise roughly 9.5 million Canadians born between 1946 and 1965. There are also about 4.5 million Canadians who are older than baby boomers, most of whom are now in their retirement years. Much has been written on the aging population and its effect on virtually all aspects of life, including education, product delivery, and health care. Ultimately, as the Canadian population ages, we are becoming a society heavily influenced by the need and attitudes of consumers over age 50. An important trend to monitor is the growth of the segments of Canadians over age 65 as the leading age edge of the baby boomer population reaches this milestone retirement age. Advisors are expected to adjust their services offering to reflect the needs of their client base, which is increasingly made up of retired Canadians. At the other end of the spectrum, millennials, those born in the 1980s and first half of the 1990s represent 27% of the total population, making it the largest generation of Canadians. There are significant economic differences between millennials and baby boomers. According to Statistic Canada, millennials have higher mortgage debts, higher student loan debts, and a lower net worth than baby boomers at that age. 
millennials though still have the time and resources to catch up by employing sound saving and investment strategies. Defined benefit and defined contribution pension plans. A defined benefit or DB pension plan provides employees with a predetermined specific payment amount of funds when they retire whereas a defined contribution or DC pension plan allows employees and employers to contribute to a plan that invests funds over time to save for retirement. But a final benefit amount at retirement will depend on how the contributions are invested over the, the plan's life. A DB pension plan's risks such as longevity, market volatility, and low interest rates are borne entirely by the employer because they have to cover a pension shortfall, which is classified as a liability on financial statements. As a result, employers are gradually shifting to DC pension plans to pass on the risk to the employees. Hybrid pension plans, a combination of DB and DC plans, also gaining traction in Canada. Saving rates. Generally, Canadians have several common sources of retirement income. Employer pension plan, Canada pension plan, Quebec pension plan, and old age security. Income from personal savings, such as registered retirement saving plans, tax-free saving account or TFSAs, a non-registered account, the liquidation of fixed asset or downsizing of a principal residence, the sales of a business or the creation of succession plan where the business passes on to family members but still pays the original owner an income. A common notion is that Canadians will need 70% of their income at retirement. This figure is a rule of thumb. Some clients might need less, others might need more. Depending on their expected retirement lifestyle, it is recommended that the individual saves 10 to 20% of their pre-tax income during their working years. However, recent studies indicate that the level of Canadian savings has fallen below 2%. Household debt levels. Household debt is defined by Statistic Canada's mortgage debt on principal residence, vacation homes, and other real estate as well as consumer debts. Consumer debt refers to outstanding debt on credit card, personal and home equity lines of credit, secured and unsecured loans from financial institutions, and unpaid bills such as rent and taxes. Debt levels continue to be an area of concern in Canada, while debt-to-income level have remained steady in the past three years at approximately 172% of disposable income the level of debt to income was closer to 100% of disposable income in 2000. An individual's inability to service debt can increase stress levels. Concerns arise when interest rates are poised to increase because the cost of servicing debt and bankruptcies tend to rise. Cryptocurrency Crypto assets have been gaining popularity around the world. Crypto assets are assets that exist only in digital form and use cryptography to prevent counterfeiting and fraudulent transactions and relies on peer-to-peer -peer networking and a public ledger to regulate the creation and transfer of assets without the use of an intermediary. One of the more popular examples of a crypto asset is Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency that launched in 2009. 
Bitcoin, as the largest and most actively traded cryptocurrencies, is slowly making its way into the traditional investing world. Although not without still facing significant investor concerns and regulatory hurdles over and above those that more traditional investments such as stocks and bonds typically face. Bitcoin investment or trading vehicles include trusts, mutual funds, including the recent listed closed and Bitcoin fund in Canada, hedge funds, futures and options, and in Europe, a limited number of ETFs. In North America, regulators have yet to approve Bitcoin ETFs at the time of writing, although there are related blockchain ETFs trading in the United States. Other Bitcoin investment vehicles include venture capital and private equity. These investment vehicles join peer-to-peer -peer licensed and unlicensed exchanges and Bitcoin ATMs as ways to gain direct access to this asset. Bitcoin is powered by open source code known as blockchain, which creates a shared public ledger. The shared public ledger is available to record and validate the transactions that have taken place in the past, which cannot be altered. Each transaction is a block that is chained to the code, creating a permanent record of each transaction. Blockchain technology is at the heart of more than 2,200 cryptocurrencies that have followed in Bitcoin's wake. Bitcoin's value is derived from both its use as a medium of exchange or intrinsic value and as a store of value or monetary value. More recently, Bitcoin is also being more seriously considered as a separate asset class that provides diversification benefit to a traditional portfolio comprised of stocks and bonds. The unique characteristics of Bitcoin enables the disruption of money, gold, store of value, and payments and remittance as financial services transition toward digital platforms. It makes sense that interest in Bitcoin is growing. Some investors see Bitcoins perhaps inaccurately as digital gold. Summary. In this chapter, we discuss the following key aspect of Canadian securities industry. Canadian capital markets are among the most sophisticated and efficient in the in the world, as indicated by the variety and size of new issues brought to the markets and the depths and liquidity of secondary markets trading. The three categories of investment dealer firms are integrated, institutional, and retail. Integrated firms offer products and services that cover all aspects of the industry. Institutional firms primarily handle the trading activity of large clients such as pension funds and mutual funds. At the retail level, full-service firms offer a wide variety of products and services and self-directed brokers offer reduced trading rates but do not provide advice. One main role of investment dealers is to bring new issues of securities to the primary markets. They also facilitate trading in the secondary markets. These firms can act as principals or agents in either market. The Canadian chartered banks are the largest financial intermediaries in the country. They are designated as Schedule 1, Schedule 2, or Schedule 3 banks. Each designation has different rules and regulations regarding ownership level and the type of services they are allowed to offer. Financial intermediaries offer a broad range of financial services that, in many cases, overlaps with the services provided by chartered banks. Services include deposit taking and lending, debit and credit cards, mortgages, 
and mutual funds. Investment funds sell their shares to the public, most often in the form of closed-end or open-end or open funds, and invest the proceeds in, the, in diverse portfolio of securities. Loan companies make direct cash loans to consumers who typically repay principal and interest in installment. Pension plans represent a type of institutionalized saving. These plans are offered to the employees of many companies, institutions, and other organizations. In contrast to the execution-only model of self-directed brokerage, a new online investment service that provides investors with advice, popularly known as robo-advisors, has emerged in Canada. Robo-advisors offer goal-based online investment management, portfolio created using algorithms based on modern portfolio theory and advisor support among other services. Bitcoin is slowly making its way into the traditional investing world. Its value is derived from both its use as a medium of exchange and as a store of value. Bitcoin investment or trading vehicle includes trusts, mutual funds, hedge funds, futures and options.